t o k y o Live e n d o s c o p y One Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tokyo Live Endoscopy One. So, this session、uh, we will discuss about the endoscopic full thickness resection in the colon. So, nowadays, so,、uh, we are、uh, more and more interested in the full thickness resection. So,、uh, most of the、uh, countries,、uh, ESD is、uh, already become a standard procedure. So,、um, Uh, we are much, much more concerned about the uh, 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 full sickness resection. Uh, today, uh, I, I'm so pleased and I'm so honored to introduce my great co moderator. So,、uh, Dr. Greg Haber, so he, as、uh, everybody knows, he's a god of ERCP and he,、uh, he spent a long term in uh, uh, Canada, uh, Toronto. And then he moved to、uh, New York. And then、uh, he dedicated、uh, not only ARCP, so he covers very wide area、uh, of a minimal, minimally invasive endoscopic treatment. And the,、uh, he said that today, right now, he finished the POEM procedure. He's a great performer of the POEM procedure in the US. So it's my great honor to、so、co chair this session together with him. So, and the,、uh, we also uh, invite uh, two great uh, distinguished uh, speakers today. The first speaker is、uh, one of my colleagues. So、uh, it's my honor to introduce the,、uh, my、uh, colleague, Dr. Mayo Tanabe. So、uh, she, she was born in the United States, Memphis. And the,、uh, then after that, moved to、uh, Pittsburgh. And then after that, world moved to、uh, Germany. And then、so、she came back to Japan and they graduated the Japanese medical school. And then now she is working with me.、Uh, she is a re really talented endoscopist. She d o any types of endoscopy,、uh, but、uh, she is now most interested in、uh, uh, coronoscopy. So, she learned a lot、uh, from her c o n s t a b l e s technique, and、uh, she respects the c o n s t a b l e so much. <laughs> so,、uh, very great honor for her.、Uh, anyway, so、uh, she will talk about our technique、uh, to close uh, uh, mucosa, uh, sorry, uh, tissue defect、uh, using the loop nine. So, Dr. Mayo Tanabe, please start your lecture. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. And、um, my、um, presentation is pre recorded, so let me share. Hello, everyone. My name is Mayo Tanabe from Showa University Koto Teosu Hospital, the Jesuit Diseases Center, Tokyo, Japan. Today, I'm going to introduce a novel endoscopic defect closure method named Loop 9. I have no COI to disclose. EMR and ESD are widely accepted procedures for treating GI neoplasms. Note the scope of flexible endoscopy has increased with the introduction of nodes and the development of endoscopic full thickness resection. For successful endoscopic treatment, prevention of post operative complications. And the management of intentional perforation in EFTR are crucial. Therefore, the major concern with this advanced technique is the secure closure of the GI defects. Various methods and devices for the endoscopic closure of GI defects have been studied, such as hemoclips, the combined use of hemoclips and supplementary devices. In specially designed devices such as OTSC system and suturing devices. However, these devices are not always available and somewhat expensive. 
Among these methods, endoscopic purse string suture technique, which is inspired by surgical purse string suture strategy, was developed. In this method, an endoloop and clips have been successfully combined to manage mucosal defects. However, it requires double channel endoscope. And clinically, a single channel endoscope is more flexible and popular, especially for the treatment of right colonic lesions. So, what I'm going to introduce today is a novel loop non closure method which we invented for single channel operation. The pilot study was published in Endoscopy this year. First, I'm going to talk about the technical details. First, in this method, we applied absorbable surgical suture, which is 4-0 monofilament instead of endoloop. Contrary to the original endoloop, it is thinner and more flexible. It is easy to form in any size as well. Other than the surgical suture, we apply a small piece of felt pleasure, the outer sheath of the Olympus clip, in disposable biopsy forceps, which fits a 2mm scope channel, all commercially available devices. Loop 9 is named after its shape, number 9. We prepare a self-made slip knot with the suture, and a single knot is made at the end of the tail of the loop. The anchor with a felt pleasure, which is commonly used in cardiovascular surgery, cutting piece is placed between the knot and the loop. This video shows how to tie the knot. This is one of the knots used in laparoscopic surgery. Once it's tied, it is adjustable. Which means, by pulling one tail and by pushing the knot, it easily slides. And importantly, it does not easily get loose once it's tightened. This is the initial setting of loop 9. In the sheath, the knotted suture and an anchoring pleasure grabbed with biopsy forceps are inserted. Now, I'm going to show you an example case of loop 9 closure in colon. This is a defect after colon ESD, which lesion was about 11 times 8 cm in size. As you can see, the defect is very wide, that it is of course difficult to close with a simple clip method. So we applied loop 9 closure method in this case. First, the sheath with the loop inside is inserted through the scope, and the loop is released in the GI lumen. Second, we anchored contralateral edges of the defect with conventional clips. It is quite easy to grab the edges because the loop is free in the GI lumen. Then the biopsy forceps through the outer sheath is inserted through the scope channel. And the distal end knot is grabbed by the forceps. And as a last process, by pulling the loop tail and pushing the sheath, the knot will slide and tightly tied, which end up in approximation of the edges. In this case, three loop lines were used for approximation of the edges. As you can see, upper clips come closer and closer as the loop tightens. And finally, 
the clips crosses each other. These are pictures before and after applying loop 9 closure. As you can see, the wide and big mucosal defect shrinked with the application of loop 9s, which makes it much easier to add conventional clips to achieve complete closure. As a summary, the closure procedure consists of three steps. One, the sheet with the loop inside is inserted through the scope and the loop is released in the GI lumen. At this moment, the loop is free in the lumen. Second, anchor contralateral edges of the defect with conventional clips. And third, biopsy forceps through the outer sheath is inserted through the scope channel and the distal end knot is grabbed by the forceps. By pulling the tail and pushing the sheath, the knot will slide in tightly tied, which end up in approximation of the edges. Now I'm going to go over with the clinical results of loop knife closure after correcting ESDs in your center. A total of 50 patients underwent closure of the post correctal ESD using loop 9 method. The median age of the patients was 72 years, and 10% of the patients were under antithrombotic therapy. This slide shows lesion characteristics. In 34 cases, the lesion location was at the right side of the colon. The median size of the closed defect was 32.5 mm and complete closure was achieved in 98% of cases. The median procedure time for complete closure of the defect was 17 minutes. The median closure time per one loop was 5 minutes. A follow-up endoscopy after 4 to 5 days, sustained closure was observed in 90% of cases, and partial closure which did not require additional clips was observed in 4 cases. The partial separation was seen at the additional simple clip site and none of the loop 9 were loosened. And there were no delayed procedure adverse events such as delayed perforation, bleeding, or post-ESD electrocoagulation syndrome. So these are key points. Loop 9 is accessible and cost-effective. It can be handmade by existing materials and can be performed with single channel scope. It may be useful for various situations in therapeutic endoscopy. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So, uh, my name is thank you so much for your uh, lecture. And the, uh, uh, any question from the great uh, uh, expert? So uh, beforehand, so I have uh, one question. So uh, what the uh, maximum size of the tissue defect do you try to close? Um, I think the one I showed was the biggest one, the 11 centimeter times eight centimeter, defect. yes. So, and the uh, other time, so uh, you catch only mucosa or mucosa and muscle when you uh, catch the tissue? That's a very important question. I try to catch the muscle layer too. And, uh, but if I catch too much muscle layer, um, sometimes the clips um, crosses too much and cross, uh, the clips go inside uh, some mucosal layer. So I try to like uh, keep um, grabbing mucosal side also and the other edges of the clip, um, I put it um, into the muscle layer.
Did you also try this device to close a uh, uh, defect with two layer uh, reception? Did you try? Um, not in Colum, but we have experience in gastric EFTR. And I think it's about um, a few cases, but it was very successful with the full um, EFTR too. Mm -hmm. So any uh, comments or? Uh, well, uh, yes, that's uh, very, very impressive. And thank you very much for, for sharing that experience. Uh, um, I guess some, some of the questions that come to mind is are, uh, uh, where do you, first of all, what size clips are the particular clips that work better than other clips? So do you like a longer arm clip, a shorter arm clip? And then when you put the clip on, uh, do you like to have it totally over the mucosa? Or you did mention one arm on the mucosa and one arm in the defect. Mm -hmm. And is that because you want to grab muscle uh, with the arm which is in the defect. Could you just go over that? Because, you know, we have tried this method before uh, using a suture line that we pull through the channel of the scope and then take a second clip. In fact, I think Haru, you may have described that uh, originally a, a while ago. And one of the problems always is the the way the clips uh, intersect with each other mm -hmm. as you bring the tissue together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed you were paying very or, or giving close attention to the way the clips intersect. Maybe you could talk about that again a little bit for us. Thank you very much for the important question. Um, actually, I prefer uh, smaller uh, clips, not the long clips, because you just, just like you um, told, um, the longer clips interfere with each other when we cross, uh, when we um, tighten the loop. And uh, the second question, the, I prefer to like uh, um, put the edge, one edge in the submucosal layer or muscle layer. And uh, because I want to put the um, layer to each side, from the each side to complex this so that it will like um, connect together. And I think this will um, heal wounds better. I think in surgical, I'm, um, suture, it's the same to make it like right. this. And right. yes. And the third one, the tip to um, make the clips um, cross um, well, um, I put the sheath, tip of the sheath um, between the clip clips so that um, it won't go under the submucosal layer. So if I put the sheath tip between the clips, it will um, go well. It will keep it up, yeah. Yes. So let me ask you, is there any concern or, or do you have a sense of the geometry as to how close a clip can be to the slip knot? Do you have to be careful that you're not like right beside the slip knot? Do you have to be a centimeter away from the slip knot or does it make any difference? Um, you mean the loop? Um, it's well, you so put the loop. Mm -hmm. And then you put uh, two clips, mm -hmm. uh, one clip on the distal right. and one clip closer to the slip knot or uh, on the proximal side. So actually, the question is, mm -hmm. does it matter if you're right over the slip knot, if this is the knot and if you're right there, mm -hmm. or do you want to be a little bit away from the knot? Um, I, um, actually, it doesn't matter where we put the clips in, uh, but not too close to the slip knot, of course, but it doesn't really matter because the tension um, goes like uh, equally um, to the clips and um, I can control it, it with the tip of the sheath. Yeah. Okay. So I like to say uh, uh, additional word. Thank you. So she used this uh, loop line in the colon. I, I myself use this device in the stomach, uh, even for close, uh, even to close the uh, uh, full, full thickness of resection in the stomach. So, uh, so regarding the approximation of the tissue, so using a loop and click technique. So sometimes, so uh, uh, approximation of the uh, both side uh, uh, mucosa edge is not perfect, uh, but we are thinking uh, such a situation is uh, like a space suture. So then, so we uh, next, 
after the loop lines or next, uh, we use a regular clip to close the tissue directly. Then we can make a tight application. Mm -hmm. So it, it, uh, we decide everything on the endoscopy image. So, so first big defect. So uh, using the loop line technique, we uh, anyway, we uh, 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 approximate the boss uh, cut end to close using loop line. And then after that, sometimes we use a, a direct clip a conventional way. Or uh, if, if necessary, we place a two or three loop line. Is that the uh, technique we use? Right. Well, no, it's, it looks like it's very effective. I, um, I have to say that in, in the United States now, I'm not sure if you have this yet, we call it's a system called XTAC. Now, XTAC is uh, by Apollo, the uh, overstitch company. I'm sure Sergey is very familiar with this, but it's very similar. It's uh -huh. basically uh, clips with the suture attached, and then using a cinch device, you can pull those, pull the suture, and the uh, the clips come together. So mm -hmm. it's a uh, uh, a manufactured device which is uh, quite similar, called XTAC. And but I think the principles as to where you put the clip and how you draw the mucosal edges together are very similar. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. No, I, I never use it stuck uh, so far. So is it a technique to our uh, key pack? Ah, yeah, no, so no, screw. I, I remember, screw. It's a screw, yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, a, it's a tissue screw. Ah, yeah, I remember. Uh, so you just drive it into the mucosa uh, and it has a suture already attached. Mm -hmm. And then a second suture goes through the scope, a second uh, 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 tissue attachment screw goes through the scope over the suture. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it works uh, very well, very similar um, to this. Uh, and it, but it, it's not good for full thickness closure, just for mucosal closure, uh -huh. because the screw that you use only goes through the mucosa. So you pull mucosa, it's very difficult to get muscle, to pull muscle together. So for full thickness, I think the principle is we have to have the muscle edges brought close together. x tac will not do that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, good information to us. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, I think uh, I would like to move on to the uh, next great speaker. So, um, uh, Greg, uh, would you uh, mind introducing the uh, uh, Sergey? Yes. Well, well, thank. First of all, Haru, thank you so much for the invitation to join Tokyo Live again. It uh, was a very exciting meeting last year, and the topics and the and the presenters uh, were excellent. So it's a pleasure to uh, be able to join and to uh, cooperate with you for this wonderful meeting. Now. Sergey. Sergey is a, a unique individual, I would say. Um, his topic says, um, let me see, I'm going to look at the topic. Uh, uh, yes, full thickness resection, where is the limit? If there's anybody who pushes the limit, it is Sergey. Uh, he's very inventive, a very creative, uh, He's the chief of therapeutic endoscopy at uh, Mercy uh, Medical Center in Baltimore, but he's also really a leader in the United States for innovation. Um, he's developed many devices that are used uh, for full thickness resection. He's been doing full thickness resection probably longer than uh, anybody in the United States. I, I would guess it's 20 years and I may be correct, I may be wrong, but he can correct me on that. So it, uh, uh, it gives me great pleasure to have my colleague, uh, Sergey, present this topic. And uh, we are all going to learn from Sergey and uh, his innovation. So I, I welcome his talk and uh, I, uh, I welcome him to Tokyo Live on behalf of Haru. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you very much, Haru, for inviting me. It's a really honor uh, to present today. This is the list of my disclosure. And uh, endoscopic full thickness 
the resection, generally speaking, can be done in three ways. Submucosal tonal endoscopic full thickness resection is not really applicable to colon, so I'm not going to discuss it today. And that leaves us with two options. The first option is a closed technique. When you create GI tract wall plication, and then you cut the lesion out of that plication without entering peritoneal cavity. And the first procedure for closed full thickness resection was done by Dr. George Kohler uh, in 2006. He used a flexible stapler. Unfortunately, that company uh, eventually got bankrupt, and so this flexible staple is no longer commercially available. But Avesca created their own particular system specifically for endoscopic full thickness resection. That system closely resembles a previous Avesca clip, but it's larger, and it has already a snare inside, so you create a plication with the clip, and then you cut it out. And there are several studies which look into the procedure results. The first study was prospective, and it was original study by uh, done in Germany, nine centers. And you can see 180 patients, so approximately 20 patients per center. And this study demonstrated that the uh, R0 resection rate for benign lesion was OK. It was about 77%. But our zero rejection rate for malignant lesions was very bad. It was less than 50%, 44.8. Despite the fact that the lesions were quite small, uh, average size of the lesion was uh, three centimeter and even less. But even more important problem with uh, that device was that there was significant rate of uh, complication. 10% of patients has adverse effect events during procedure, and 2% requires immediate surgery to correct those adverse events. And the reason for that was that the application is done blindly. So you never really know what you are grabbing on the outside of the colon. Colon wall is very thin, and you may be grabbing uh, bladder. You may be grabbing adjusted loop of small bowel, or maybe you are grabbing big blood vessels. So from that point, uh, it really explained the number of complications. Another problem was that follow-up revealed that 15% of patients had residual tumor at the site of the resection. So uh, only 85% uh, uh, of patients did not have a, a, any residual tissue. And then there was a second study, large study uh, devoted to that device. It came from Italian experience. It was retrospective study, 114 patients. And basically, the study confirmed that adverse events are quite common, and the residual disease is still present at the site of resection. Based on what I see in the literature, I do not want to use a full sickness resection device. I think it is dangerous, and it's not that effective. And for lesion, which were two centimeter in size, I think that resection uh, with the other techniques is probably more appropriate than full sickness resection. And that uh, gives us the second option. The second option is an open technique. That's what I usually do in my practice. So you reject the lesion with access to the peritoneal cavity, and then you close the defect with reliable closure technique. So, Again, literature experience is very limited. And you can see that it's mostly retrospective observations with a small number of patients, 20, 25 patients, and with the small lesions, mostly 20, 22 uh, millimeter. We cannot really uh, learn that much from those uh, studies, so I'm not going to discuss it in these details, and we'll move towards what I do in my practice, and I do it quite common practically once a week, once every two weeks, I have to do full sickness resection in the colon. And that's the nature of my referrals because most of my referrals come in when they have already somebody tried to reject it or inject it in the income, the deletion, a lot of fibrosis. So the first picture depicts endoscopic submucosal dissection. 
Still, my preferred method of removing colonic lesion is endoscopic submucosal dissection, meaning that if there is a submucosal space, I would not want to enter peritoneal cavity. I will reject the lesion in the submucosal space. But if there is extensive fibrosis, then you have two options. The first option will be to cut out the lesion right away, full sickness, and that is not what I like to do. What I do, I usually prefer the second option, meaning that I start with endoscopic submucosal dissection, and I will progress that way as far as I can. Only when I reach the area which is completely, I cannot separate mucosa from muscularis layer, then I will go full sickness resection. Eventually, it will uh, leave the defect in the peritoneal cavity much smaller than would it will be leaving uh, during the first uh, uh, situation when you reject it from very beginning right away. So my full sickness resections are practically combination of endoscopic submucosal dissection as far as you can, and then at the uh, impossible part, then you reject muscle and full sickness. And this is one of the example. So the crucial elements in endoscopic full sickness resection will be presented on next several movies. The first crucial element is that you have to have airtight lumen preserving closure if you are not able to achieve that, there is no way to do successfully endoscopic sub, uh, full sickness resection. And this is the example. So you can see that there is a big lesion located in the hepatic flexure, and uh, it was already attempted to resect in the past, and that creates extensive submucosal fibrosis. So I definitely start resection with endoscopic submucosal dissection, but it did not go very far, and you can see that eventually I end up with a, a big defect in the uh, wall of the colon, and that's the final stage of the resection where I cut uh, the final connection plane, and you can see all this defect uh, in the muscle. It happened that it is on the mesenteric side, and it's not going into the free peritoneal cavity, uh, but it still needs to be closed uh, fully, and I close all full sickness uh, defect with the endoscopic suturing. This time I was trying to close it with the separate stitches, and you can see that the first stitch is done. Now the second stitch is done as well, and it's a pretty good closure, but I thought that that's not enough, and there was a small defect here, so I am going for the third stitch. And after the third stitch was tightened, and by the way, this is the overstitch, the device uh, which uh, is really, really beneficial uh, for me when I am working in the colon or upper GI tract and doing endoscopic full sickness uh, resection. So you can see that after the third stitch, uh, the lumen is almost completely shut down. You, you cannot leave it like this because then patient will be obstructed. So I had to find a place where the balloon can go through and I have to stretch it to open up the lumen. And then I had to prove that the colonoscope can go through that place. And uh, you will see it in a second that I can go with colonoscope into more proximal part of the colon, into the right side of the colon. Uh, I would not leave it uh, without opening because the patient will come back with uh, 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 colonic obstruction. So here you can see we're going through. So this is the cecum ahead of us. So everything is okay and we can, we can stop. But once again, the key element uh, for endoscopic full sickness resection is airtight lumen present preserving closure. The second crucial element for endoscopic full sickness resection also applicable to endoscopic submucosal dissection. And this crucial element is dynamic multidirectional traction and stabilization. If you don't have a stable position inside the colon, you will fail with ESD and it will be extremely dangerous with full sickness resection as well. Uh, in this particular movie, I'm using dilumen, which is double balloon 
uh, therapeutic platform. And you can see there is a lesion in the transverse colon. And this patient had four previous uh, piecemeal resection. So it's very clear that there is a lot of scar tissue. And when I'm trying to inject, uh, the polyp is not lifting. It's granular type lesion and it's uh, good as 3S. So I do not see malignancy. I think that uh, it's not lifting because of extensive submucosal fibrosis. And it's just question of time when I will have to uh, go full sickness. But nevertheless, I start with uh, submucosal dissection and I progress with submucosal dissection as far as I can. And you see, this is the four balloon of the device. It's actually done uh, with the first generation of dilumen. Uh, the second generation of dilumen is specifically designed for traction. That one did not have suture loops placed on it. So in order to do traction, I need to attach clip uh, to the plastic of the four balloon. Once again, that's the first generation of the device. Now it's much easier. So here you can see that we are entering already muscle. And in addition to multiple resection, they also injected in the ink right under the polyp. So in that situation, it's uh, resulted in a very extensive fibrosis. So I'm trying to attach uh, the four balloon to the polyp to provide traction, but the clip slides from the polyp. It stays on the plastic, but did not really help me much with the traction. So in that situation, I want to get a little bigger margin of the polyp so that the second clip will not slide. And you can see that I'm doing full sickness resection. Again, it's impossible to predict if you are on mesenteric side of the colon or if you are cutting into the free peritoneal cavity. It just happened that two cases in a row that I'm showing, I'm on mesenteric side, but I will show you uh, free peritoneal cavity as well in a second on the next movie. So here we rejected uh, more of the polyp and now I'm pulling four balloon towards me. And this time I'm grabbing with the clip bigger chunk of the polyp so it will uh, stay uh, connected. Now that I connect it, I can use dynamic retraction. I'm pushing the uh, four balloon away from me, and that gives me significant amount of traction and putting the uh, fiber connecting mucosa and muscularis tissue under traction. So from that point, procedure becomes much more manageable. I can actually uh, get out of the muscularis, and because of the traction, I can separate it completely and the uh, finish procedure much easier. So you see how extensive this fibrosis, there was no way to do something uh, like that uh, without uh, full sickness resection. So this part is already not full sickness. So I'm cutting right above the muscle. And the reason I can do that is because the traction which provided to me by the lumen. Here you can see we're almost done. It's a large polyp about five centimeter in size. And uh, so it takes a little longer, uh, some blood vessels with bleeding and the traction exposed the blood vessels as source of bleeding so well that I can easily cauterize it and stop it as well. So here you can see that I don't need to use quark grasper and can just stop it with the dual knife. So this, the right side of the polyp is completely released. And now we're going to the left side of the polyp and uh, traction assisting me and giving me a good exposure. Distal attachment is not very easy to use when you are doing full sickness resection. You need to see more than what you need to see during regular ESD. But uh, you can see how stable my position. And that's because of the after balloon of the dilumen is holding the colonoscope in place. So I never lose the view. So now we're done. Everything is removed and the polyp is separated. And you clearly see that this part uh, was rejected full sickness. 
Now I'm pulling the uh, endoscope out of the colon through the lumen, but the lumen is staying in place, and now it will serve me as a conduit to insert the suturing device. Suturing device uh, for double channel scope is mounted on the gastric lens colonoscope, but through the lumen, it's very easy to insert it. And now we are doing full sickness uh, closure. So I'm not just grabbing uh, mucosa, I'm grabbing the strongest layer of the colonic wall, which is submucosa and muscle. And you see that I'm using a continuous suture just to speed up a little. So that's the end of the procedure. Uh, it just took uh, one suture and now we are cinching it together and it will be a full closure, full sickness closure of the full sickness defect. And the lumen is fully preserved, not like on the first case. So uh, we are marking it with tattoo and uh, that's the end of the procedure. And you can see that the lesion rejected with clear margin and it's about five centimeter polyp. Another example uh, is on the next one. And again, this is example of stabilization and multi-directional dynamic traction uh, with the help of the lumen. So they sent me this young uh, lady, uh, uh, 51 years old, who had a, a lesion, submucosal lesion in the cecum. I used endoscopic ultrasound probe uh, to detect the lesion. And so I saw that it's submucosal, so it will likely end up with a full sickness resection. Like always, I start with a circumferential incision using dual knife. And after circumferential incision is completed, I am using this time a new generation, current generation of dilumen, which already has a sutures attached to the four balloon. So I don't need to attach the lesion to the plastic, I will attach it to the suture loop, which is much, much easier to do. So you just put a, uh, when you attach to the plastic, one branch stays on the plastic, one branch on the polyp, and that's, uh, uh, can easily slide. Here you can see the suture already attached. One suture is short and it's a green, and one suture is long and it's black. So when I do push technique, I use a short suture. When I do pull technique, I use a long suture. So you can see that uh, it's in the cecum. So I will use pull technique. I will pull lesion towards me. And that's why I'm using the long suture. So I attach it in two places, uh, one opposite to another, so that the entire lesion will be pulled uh, out of the colon into the colonic lumen. And then I'm doing endoscopic submucosal dissection, which significantly facilitated by the strong traction. The lumen provide me very strong traction. You can see very clearly that the tissue which I'm cutting is under uh, traction and very well exposed. So the lesion appeared small to me. When I measured it with endoscopic ultrasound, it was just 10 millimeters. So when I started to do dissection, I keep dissecting, dissecting, and I don't see the end of the lesion. So at some point uh, of the dissection, I realized that this is not the sickle submucosal lesion. The lesion was actually originating in the appendix. So what I'm doing, I am pulling the appendix into the sickle out of the peritoneal cavity and I'm dissecting connection between appendix and the cecum. And this would not be possible if I did not have such a strong traction. It was not a long procedure. Uh, the entire procedure took me something like 45 minutes. And uh, uh, mostly because it was not a, uh, it was facilitated uh, by the traction. And you can also see how stable position of the endoscope. So at this point, uh, I will have to go already full sickness. There is no more uh, submucosa left. And I will show you in a second the entire length of the appendix. So the whole appendix is pulled into the cecum. 
and it was dynamic retraction. So from time to time, I would release uh, the traction to go to the opposite side, and then I will increase it again to go to this front side. But we got to the tip of the appendix, and so at that point, I will have to enter peritoneal cavity. Most of the procedure was done inside, but here you can see we already entered in peritoneal cavity, free peritoneal cavity, because I did not want to cut through the part of the appendix and leave some of the appendix behind. So I have to reject the entire appendix. As soon as I enter peritoneal cavity, I give patient uh, antibiotics and it's usually Cipro and Flagyl. And after full sickness rejection, I continue with antibiotics, the same antibiotics for seven full days. I don't admit patients to the hospital after full sickness rejection, they all discharge, that patient went home too. So here you can see we rejected the entire appendix. Now we are cutting uh, the, the suture loop, which was at uh, attached to the appendix and extracting appendix through the dilumen out of the colon. And then we go with uh, the suturing device using dilumen as a conduit to, de uh, to deliver suturing device into the cecum. It took two continuous sutures to close it. And again, it was a full sickness rejection. So I need to do a full sickness suture. Just to speed uh, this process. Uh, finishing the suturing removing the uh, suturing device and going back through the same conduit. And that's the end of the procedure. You can see no mass lesion and everything is rejected. No part of the appendix is present and that's the rejected appendix. Pathological examination confirmed that appendix is removed in entirety with uh, all clean margins and uh, they detected into susception as a cause of the problem there. So the final crucial element for both endoscopic full sickness rejection, endoscopic appendectomy and ESD as well, and other transluminal intervention is improvement of the local visualization and retraction platform. So, Currently, we have two devices. One is called distal attachment by Olympus, and another one is ST hood by Fuji. Both devices placed on the tip of the endoscope, and they serve as a spacer devices. They provide very limited view, and they don't really provide any retraction. Uh, you just lift the specimen, you put specimen away, but the view is limited, especially when you use Fuji and you need to have significant amount of dissection before you enter submucosal space. So I'm using now this a brand new device which called EndoCage. And uh, this is how it works. So you see that EndoCage is mounted on top of the endoscope just like the uh, distal attachment or ST hood, but it does not really affect your view. And it requires very minimal circumferential incision. And after circumferential incision is completed, then you can uh, put endocage right into the small circumferential incision, no matter how small it is. And then you see how it expose you uh, the fibers and put the fibers under the tension. And then you can easily cut it and your view is not limited. So if you are doing full sickness rejection, it's very important, especially if you are on mesenteric side, you want to see every blood vessel. You don't want to get into the big mesenteric artery because the view was limited. And this is providing also dynamic uh, retraction because after I pull it enough and there is no more traction, then I would just let it go and put it more. And you see that we started with a very limited uh, entrance into the submucosal space, but with endocage, we pull it more and more and getting a uh, bigger exposure of the submucosal fibers. And here I let it go. 
Now I will go again under, easily grab it and pull more. So now I expose more distal fibers and continue to do that dissection. It's much easier and more controlled way to cut the fiber which is under traction, especially if you are doing full sickness resection, then traction, uh, local traction is paramount because there is no submucosal fluid. And uh, the only help that you have is from pulling uh, the specimen away and you cannot pull it that far with the current version of distal attachment or ST hood. So I think that this device will change the way we do ESD and will change the way we do uh, endoscopic full sickness resection. Once again, you see I'm pulling it away and it's practically no connection left. All procedure lasted 12 minutes and uh, you will see how clean is uh, the specimen and uh, there is nothing left and that's the end of the procedure. We are using that same device also for a new type of closure, but I had only 15 minutes, so I did not have chance to present that as well, probably next time. So in conclusion, where we are now and where are the limits? So endoscopic full sickness resection has not become a standard of care. And so it should be used with extreme caution. That's where we are now. And uh, dynamic multi-directional traction and stabilization dramatically facilitate both full sickness resection, endoscopic submucosal dissection, and enable fully endoscopic appendectomy and other future therapeutic intervention. And we need uh, new endoscopic devices and platform to expand the current limits of endoscopic full sickness resection to, in, uh, to do more uh, clinical use for transluminal appendectomy and to use different and new type of other nodes procedure. So the limit is our endoscopic devices at platform. And when they will catch up with that, I think that we have enough skills to tackle more difficult procedures, more difficult transluminal interventions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergey. Um, as always, uh, expanding our horizons tremendously. Um, some of the things, you know, the dilumen, Sergey, has been around for a long time, as you know. And um, the uptake has not been that quick. A lot of people find it cumbersome, um, you know, difficult to manipulate and orient the, the balloon. Um, and now, as you say, there's a, a sort of a second iteration. Do you think uh, that Dilumen uh, just needs better education, a better engineering, or better understanding by the endoscopic community? What are the limitations in having this technology sort of be uh, getting disseminated? Yeah. So Dilumen was introduced in the beginning of 2017. Unfortunately, that first generation had multiple, multiple technical issues. But over the last three years, uh, they all were improved. And the biggest problem, the biggest problem was that there was no hydrophilic coating inside the lumen. So you have to use a lot of lubrication. And if the patient is not clean and there is a lot of stool, then you get stuck. The endoscope gets stuck. And that discouraged many, many people from using the lumen again. Luckily, for the last three months, they started the company finally uh, come to the census and they finally started to do all devices with hydrophilic coating. With hydrophilic coating, it's extremely easy to slide in and out of the dilumen. You don't get stuck. And I think now there is much more people using dilumen than before. Obviously the COVID strike and with the COVID there was less opportunity to teach and less uh, hands-on courses and so forth. But we started the hands-on courses again and I'm teaching Dilumen and uh, uh, our first hands-on course, course uh, in three weeks. 
And uh, I think the new generation of that alumen is completely different from what we were exposed before. And people will get much higher acceptance rate with that one. Yeah. Listen, I, I think, uh, Sergey, you've quite correctly uh, uh, established the need for good traction for efficiency for ESD and to accomplish um, the uh, RO resection margin that you like. Now, what, you know, the traction that you use with the, the dilumin, the, the short and the long loop, uh, you know, there are some limitations. What, what about just going with some of the more simple traction devices? Are you using the Microtech uh, elastic band with, I know it's not off the market now, but it had been on the market with the three circular loops in the elastic band or just plain elastic bands, just taking elastics, putting one side on one and one on the other, cut it off if you don't like it, use two or three elastic bands. This seems to me to be much simpler, much more straightforward. Uh, I, what do you think about that? And I think you're a master of ESD and I respect your opinion, but I would say that simpler traction devices are, uh, uh, would be, uh, I think, more widely disseminated again. I I think that there is nothing wrong with that device, with Microtech or other similar devices. My problem with them is that they don't give me enough flexibility. They provide static traction. So you clip it in one place and it will be very limited traction and it's not bi-directional. When I do ESD, I always want to check the, uh, that from one side, from another side, and uh, to make sure that I'm still getting a free margin. And if you put a clip with the loop, or if you use, uh, let's say, clip with the floss, it's traction in one direction. You cannot go back. And I like to have more uh, kind of influence on that process. And from that point, dynamic retraction, that's the way I want to go. You cannot okay. take it away from dilumen. So far, dilumen is the only one which gives you. And another issue is that those devices don't stabilize colonoscope inside the lumen. So for example, if you're working on hepatic flexure or splenic flexure, stability is very important because if the colonoscope pushed too far, then you already pass the polyp. Or if the colonoscope pulled back, then you are uh, not seeing the polyp, it's behind the fold. With dilumen, I can distend the balloon and stabilize the colonoscope inside. And it's very important to complete ESD and even more important for full sickness uh, resection. You cannot just fly into the peritoneal cavity. You want to be very stable there. And uh, the third advantage which dilumen gives me is that I can advance suturing device through it. Yes. Uh, uh, clips with loops and clips with floors help you to do dissection. But uh, as Dr. Tanabe demonstrated, and I think it's more and more accepted that after ESD, you have to close those defects somehow. You cannot leave the defect open, especially on the uh, left side of the colon when the stool is hard and it's scratching and causing delayed bleeding. So for me, it's very important that I suture every single defect post ESD to decrease the amount of delayed complications. So dilumin helps me to navigate suturing device through the colon effortlessly. It cannot be achieved with other techniques. So I think that we need a therapeutic platform and we need some local improvement in the devices, whether it's knife, or spacing device, things like that. And then ESD and full sickness resection will become a mainstream in the United States. Yeah. So great. So may I ask a question to Sergey? Yes, yes, yes. please. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for a great lecture on uh, Dr. Sergey Kuntzeboy. And the uh, first, uh, I think the uh, uh, overstitch uh, uh, so far, uh, in this area, so overstitch is actually uh, uh, so, uh, tie over the uh, tissue. So it's a totally same procedure to a surgical closure. So uh, it's a most reliable device, but the, uh, in Japan, it's a problem is uh, too expensive. So it's a, a cost of the uh, overstitch is uh, uh, almost same to a surgical uh, fee. 
So I saw one of the uh, limitation to use overstitch, but so scientifically, not economically. Scientifically, I think the overstitch is a, a, a best device uh, to close a defect uh, tightly and uh, securely close. So, and you also develop the dilumen. The dilumen is a platform. So we can do the uh, procedure in uh, keeping the lumen enough. So, uh, so it's uh, another another uh, great endanger in endanger. So, um, and the uh, uh, my question is the uh, you talk about the uh, uh, append appendectomy. So I also think um, sometimes uh, appendix is uh, located behind behind the cecum. So. Uh, if we can approach from, from the uh, cecum side, it's the best way. So it's not necessary to looking for the where the uh, 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 appendicitis is. Uh, so like, like that during surgery, sometimes we are looking for. But so in this, uh, your approach, uh, we, uh, we can easily identify the append appendical orifice and then cutting from the uh, inside uh, from a cecum side, and then uh, retrogradely uh, we can mobilize the uh, append appendix. So it's a great idea. And uh, you also have the uh, closing technique. So I think it's a perfect uh, condition. So my question is the uh, sometimes inflamed, inflamed append appendix has the uh, large feeding artery. So how do you manage it endoscopically? It's a great question and it's a big concern. But what I think, I think that endoscopic procedure is not for acute appendicitis. When somebody has acute appendicitis and we can diagnose it now in United States, when patients come to emergency room, they, they do a CAT scan and they can see how big appendix, exact location, diameter and so forth. I think that in that situation, we can just administer antibiotics cool down that process, decrease the size of the edema and swelling, and then schedule patient for elective colonoscopy to remove that appendix when everything cooled down. That's the way I see it. I okay. think that when the patient comes with acute appendicitis, it will be very difficult to prepare this patient, to make him okay. drink four liters of fluid and stuff like that when patient is so sick and the appendicitis is ready to perforate probably not the right time to do it. Uh, but okay, okay. we have a lot of people who have chronic appendicitis, recurrent appendicitis. So we treat it with antibiotics and when everything cools down, then we electively remove it, just like they are doing with cholecystitis. Most of the people who come with cholecystitis gets antibiotics, bowel rest, everything cools down and then electively they remove gallbladder laparoscopically. So a similar situation here. Yeah, thank That's you so much. I, I, only only elective cases. So, yeah, thank you so much. The only the only other thing I would mention is that when you, uh, in terms of the um, unseen arteries and and bleeding that you don't anticipate, when you do full thickness resection, even if you're limiting it to one or two centimeters at the base of the a gist or the most uh, tethered down part of your polyp, you still cannot see what is on the serosal side of what you're cutting. There's no way. So, I mean, what, what I do, which I think is very good, is to use a bipolar cutting device. So we use the SB knife or the clutch cutter because then you have to go through with one uh, prong of the knife and you grab the tissue and you cauterize before you cut. And I think that's the safest way now to uh, look after unseen arteries. Of course, you could use Doppler and other devices to look for it, but that slows you down. We don't do it. So I'm a, a big fan of uh, SB knife or clutch cutter uh, or basically a scissors coagulation and then cutting device whenever you're going through to uh, an unknown area. I agree 100%. Another thing which I uh, suggest is that I always keep that... Uh, uh, the hemispray in the room. Because if you get into that situation when there is a massive bleeding, 
and, and suddenly you are full of blood and you don't see where it is originating, the only way to save you is to spray Hema spray, stop it temporarily so that you can see the bleeding vessel and then definitely clutch cutter or SB knife to cauterize that blood vessel and continue your procedure. So that's what yeah. I do. It, it helped me many times. Hmm. Good. Well, um, this has been uh, a very exciting session. Uh, we're seeing uh, sort of therapeutic endoscopy uh, being pushed to the limits and seeing what our limits are and seeing how we can handle and anticipate uh, complications and look after them before they occur. And I think that probably the most important thing about therapeutic endoscopy, endoscopy is always thinking what can go wrong, not what can go right. If, when everything goes right, nobody has to worry. And I think uh, what we've learned today, what can go wrong with large uh, uh, resections? Can we get delayed bleeding? Can we get micro perforations? And what we've learned today is how to anticipate these problems and to prophylactically uh, create these closures that will prevent these things from happening. So it's been uh, very exciting, uh, very clear presentations. And uh, I'm very thankful to our speakers and especially thankful to Professor Ainui again for bringing us all together and allowing us to share our knowledge uh, and disseminate this uh, around the world. So uh, congratulations to Tokyo Live 2021 and many thanks uh, to our speakers.